Hello class, this is Fire Service Hydraulics and Water Supply, Chapter 7, Apparatus Equipped with a Fire Pump. After completing this lesson, you will be able to understand the use of fire department pumpers and identify types of apparatus equipped with fire pumps. The first learning objective we're going to cover is we will explain the use of fire department pumpers and then we have a couple more learning objectives which we'll come back to a little bit later in the chapter but the second learning objective is we will explain when and how initial attack fire apparatus are used learning objective three we will explain when and how wildland fire apparatus are used learning objective four will explain when and how mobile water supply apparatus are used Learning Objective 5 will explain when and how aerial apparatus equipment with fire pumps are used. Learning Objective 6 explains when and how rescue vehicles equipped with fire pumps are used. And number 7 explains when and how aircraft rescue and firefighting apparatus are used. So let's start with Learning Objective 1. We will explain the use of fire department pumpers. The majority of all emergency calls to which fire departments respond are handled using pumpers, engine pumpers. Depending on jurisdiction, there are several other names or nicknames that may be used. The main purpose of the pumper is to provide water at adequate pressure to produce an effective fire stream from the nozzle. Most municipal water supply systems do not supply water from a hydrant at a pressure high enough to produce an effective stream once it travels through the length of hose to the nozzle. Many locations lack municipal water supply as well, and the pumper must impart pressure on water drawn from a static water supply source, such as a lake, for instance. NFPA Standard 1901 specifies minimum pump capacity for vehicles to be considered fire department pumpers to be pumping at least or have the capability to pump at least 750 gallons or 3,000 liters per minute. Any standard pump capacity that is larger than 750 gallons or 3,000 liters per minute typically increase in increments of 250 gallons per minute or 1,000 liters per minute. Municipal pumpers rarely have pump capacities that exceed 2,000 gallons per minute or 8,000 liters per minute. Industrial pumpers may have pump capacities of more than 3,000 gallons per minute or 12,000 liters per minute. In addition to a fire pump or the pump itself, the fire department pumper must also have intake and discharge pump connections, pump and engine controls, a full set of gauges, and perhaps some other instrumentation that will be present as well. NFPA Standard 1901 also requires vehicles to have an onboard water tank capacity of at least 300 gallons or 1,100 liters in order to be a fire department pumper. And most fire department pumpers have a water tank capacity ranging between 500 gallons, or which is 2,000 liters, and 1,000 gallons, which is 4,000 liters. In some agencies, particularly in a rural area, they may operate a pumper with a water tank that contains more than 1,000 gallons or 4,000 liters. These are examples of the chassis that fire department pumpers may be built on. You have on the left a custom, custom chassis, on the right is a commercial chassis. A custom chassis is a chassis designed specifically for application as a fire apparatus. It is designed for very harsh conditions under which emergency vehicles operate and is totally equipped with larger cabs that accommodate more firefighter and equipment than a regular commercial cab. The primary disadvantage to a custom chassis is they tend to be considerably more expensive than a commercial chassis. A commercial chassis is not designed specifically for application as a fire apparatus and it can be used for other applications besides a fire apparatus, so they're generally modified for firefighting use. They have a lower purchase cost and a ready availability of replacement parts at a local level. Unless specified properly and modified appropriately, they may have insufficient power, braking ability, 
or load carrying capacity for safe use as a fire apparatus. NFPA standard 1901 contains a list of the minimum portable equipment that all pumpers must carry, including ground ladders that include roof extension and attic reachable ladders. Then you have also required various sizes and length of attack and supply fire hose, various sizes and types of nozzles, nozzles adapters and fittings, SCBA and spare cylinders, rescue and extrication tools, forceful entry equipment, ventilation fans, salvage equipment, portable fire extinguishers, and first aid and medical equipment. The combination of rescue vehicle and pumper exists in a lot of areas. These carry a larger than standard amount of rescue and extrication equipment. They're typically designed with more compartment and storage space. Personnel on the apparatus can function as engine or rescue company. In addition to a standard engine company equipment, rescue pumpers commonly contain items such as hydraulic extrication to, uh, tools like jaw of life, for instance, hose reels, power units. Also, they have pneumatic lifting and cutting equipment, SCBA cascade refilling systems, moderate to large quantities of cribbing, battery and electrically operated cutting impact and drilling tools as well. Some review questions. Remember, these will show up on quizzes and future tests. First question, why are fire department pumpers needed? That will be on page 119 of your text. Next question, list at least four pieces of equipment that a pumper may carry. That will be on page 120 and 121 of your text. Learning objective two, we will explain when and how initial fire attack apparatus are used. An initial attack fire apparatus performs most of the same functions as a full-sized fire department pumper. Their primary difference is overall size and capability. They generally have smaller pumps and water tanks than a regular pumper and carry considerably less equipment. They are constructed on commercial truck chassis only and many are equipped with all-wheel drive. So they're like a first strike weapon to essentially buy a little bit of time if the engine is or the pumper is delayed for some reason. And they can get there a little bit faster. Small rural fire departments use initial attack fire apparatus to make a quick response to fire and other emergencies with limited personnel until additional personnel and larger apparatus can arrive. So they're commonly found in suburban and urban fire departments as well, where they're often used to supplement larger apparatus on a minor fire or an EMS response. And they can approach a hard to reach, reach place a little bit easier than a large pumper. Now there are two types of initial attack fire apparatus. You have a mini pumper and a midi pumper, and we're gonna talk about those. The mini pumper is a smaller sized initial attack fire apparatus. It's often mounted on a one or one and a half ton chassis. So as you can see, this is a modified pickup chassis that this pumper is mounted on. NFPA standard 1901 requires all initial attack fire apparatus to have a minimum pump capacity of 250 gallons per minute or 1,000 liters per minute. There have been recent improvements in diesel engine technology that now allow pumping capabilities of up to 1,500 gallons per minute or 6,000 liters per minute. These are very new models, however, so most jurisdictions don't have them quite yet. This standard also requires them to carry at least 200 gallons or 800 liters of water on board. Some apparatus also carry, and remember we're still talking about mini pumpers here, some apparatus also carry basic medical and extrication equipment enabling to serve as rescue unit. Some apparatus are equipped also with a turret gun that can be supplied directly from another pumper. Small size and maneuverability of a mini pumper allows it to get into small spaces and help set up a master stream. Mini pumpers that have an all-wheel drive capability are commonly used to provide fire service 
fighting capabilities, emergency medical services during inclement weather as well. These are often used in addition in rural areas where there are unimproved or unpaved roads that can be challenging or dangerous for larger and heavier apparatus. Now we're going to talk about MIDI pumper. The main differences between a MIDI pumper and a MIDI pumper are size, pump capacity, and amount of equipment carried. A MIDI pumper is usually built on a chassis of over 12,000 pounds gross vehicle rate, or GVW, which is 5,443 kilograms. They typically carry the same types of equipment as a mini pumper, but more of it because they have much greater size. Review questions. First one, what is an advantage to using a mini pumper? That is on page 121 and 122 of the manual. Next question, how does a MIDI pumper differ from a mini pumper? That's on page 122 of your manual. Learning objective three, we will explain when and how wildland fire apparatus are used. Wildland fire apparatus have requirements for fire apparatus that are designed specifically to attack wildland fires, which differ from an apparatus designed to attack a structural fire. Wildland fire apparatus need to be very maneuverable and operate, able to operate on poor roads or off-road. They also must be able to pump water while in motion. And NFPA standard 1906 stipulates design requirements specifically for wildland fire apparatus. The smallest of these types of vehicles are mounted on four or six wheel or tracked all-terrain vehicles. And they typically have carry less than 100 gallons or 400 liters of water and have pump capacities less than 100 gallons per minute or 400 liters per minute. More commonly, you have wildland fire apparatus that are constructed on a pickup truck style one ton or one and a half ton commercial chassis. So it's a commercial pickup truck chassis. These commonly carry two to 400 gallons or 800 to 1600 liters of water and have pump capacity that ranges from 100 gallons to 500 gallons per minute and that is 400 to 2,000 liters per minute. Many jurisdictions operate larger wildland apparatus that are similar in size and design to MIDI pumpers. These vehicles may carry 500 or more gallons or 2,000 liters of water and have pump capacities of 1,000 gallons per minute or 4,000 liters per minute or greater. Wildland fire apparatus are commonly equipped with a Class A foam system in addition to water. This is extremely effective in attacking wildland fires and helping to protect exposures. Both high and low energy foam systems are used. For agencies that operate within the NIMS or Fire Scope ICS, wildland fire apparatus is categorized by capability. And this table 7.1 is from your book. And this is the ICS pumper typing. So you see the type listed and its capacity and minimum capacity, minimum pump capacity and minimum tank capacity. There is a tremendous advantage when combating wildland fires with pump and roll technique. Vehicles that can pump and roll use a separate motor or power takeoff with our PTO to power the pump so that they can power the pump independently of the engine of the chassis itself and this provides a great advantage and there are two proper methods for making a moving fire attack the first method of making a moving fire attack involves firefighters using short sections of attack hose and they walk alongside the apparatus and extinguish fire as they go and you can see an example of that beautifully illustrated in this picture on this slide Method two is using nozzles that are remotely controlled from inside the cab. When attacking wildland fires and the primary means of attacking wildland fires, firefighters deploy booster or non-collapsible hose, forestry hose, or small diameter attack lines 
typically one and a half inch or 38 millimeter diameter or less. There are two types of fixed nozzles that are also commonly incorporated into wildland fire apparatus, remote control nozzles and fixed ground sweep nozzles. So you can see already the major differences between pumping from an engine for a conventional structure fire versus attacking wildland fire. The nature of the beast may be the same, but the type of involvement with that fire is quite different and requires a whole different set of equipment and apparatus. With remote control nozzles, they are similar to, but smaller than those used on airport fire apparatus. This allows a person riding in the cab of the apparatus to manipulate a fire stream while the vehicle is moving. It's much safer than having someone outside the apparatus to manually direct nozzle attached to fire hose. A fixed ground sweep nozzle that I mentioned may be attached to the front sides or undercarriage of the apparatus to extinguish fire in close proximity to the apparatus. Fixed ground sweep nozzles are effective in protecting the front of the apparatus and extinguishing small fires in short vegetation as the apparatus advances. And there's a great picture of that here on this slide. Wildland fire apparatus also carry a variety of other types of portable equipment, fire rakes, Pulaski tools, McLods, brush hooks, and shovels. They also carry portable water fire extinguishers, chainsaws, axes, bolt cutters adapted for fence and lock cutting, drip torches, flares, or fusees for lighting backfires, portable pumps for refilling the apparatus's water tank from a static water source, like a river or a lake, for instance. In Learning Objective 4, we will explain when and how mobile water supply apparatus are used. A mobile water supply apparatus is used because most fire department pumpers may carry enough water to initiate an initial attack, but not enough to sustain an extended attack at a larger fire. These are required by fire departments operating in rural areas to transport additional water for extended firefighting operations to areas without adequate water source. They have very considerably larger water tanks than a standard fire department pumper. The more common terms for these large capacity water vehicles are tanker, tender, and agencies that operate within NIMS or Firescope incident command systems call these tenders or water tenders. ICS classifies tenders by their capabilities similar to the system for classifying wildland fire apparatus. So here's the table and you see the tender or tanker types 1, 2, and 3. Their minimum, minimum pump capacity in gallons per minute and their minimum tank capacity in total overall gallons. Tankers are used to support firefighting operations in two basic ways. The first method uses tanker as a reservoir or a nurse tanker, and the second method uses tankers to shuttle water. When using a nurse tanker, this involves parking a tanker close to the pumpers, attacking the fire, and supplying them directly. It's typically not an effective practice for a long-term firefighting operation. It is preferred this method is preferred when tankers are supplying foam concentrate for extended foam firefighting operations. You need water on hand to be able to generate the foam. When you're talking about water shuttle operations, in this method, tankers dump their loads into a portable water tank or a nurse tanker or tender and then go fill off site to reload their water supply. The preferred method for supplying water, this is the preferred method for supplying water to extended firefighting operations beyond the reach of fixed water supply systems, a long hose lay, or a reliable static water supply source. Water tankers may dump their loads into a portable water or nurse tank, as we mentioned, and you see illustrations of those right here in this slide. Some fire departments operate tankers to carry commodities other than water. And there are agencies also that engage in large scale flammable or combustible liquid operations that often use tankers to carry bulk quantities of foam concentrate. 
Some larger municipal fire departments also use fuel tankers to refuel fire apparatus during a long emergency operation. NFPA Standard 1901 Chapter 7, which is called the Mobile Water Supply Apparatus Standard, states that basic design requirements for new and fire departments, or it sets the standards for these new fire department tankers. To be considered a fire department tanker, the apparatus must have a water tank with a capacity of at least 1,000 gallons or 4,000 liters. The tanker must have a minimum of 10 foot 3 inches or 0.3 meters cubed of compartment storage space. All tankers must carry at least one 6 pound flat or pick head axe, one 6 foot or longer pipe pole, and at least 200 feet or 60 meters of two and a half inch 65 millimeter or larger fire hose, two portable hand lights, a dry chemical fire extinguisher with a rating of at least 80 dash B to C and two and a half gallons or 10 liters or larger potable water fire extinguisher. There also must be at least two SCBA and one spare cylinder for each. Tankers must also carry a first aid kit, two spanner wrenches and a hydrant wrench, one each of a double male and double female hose adapter at least two and a half inches or 65 millimeters in diameter, two wheel cocks that fit the vehicle's tires properly, one traffic safety vest for each seat in the apparatus, five MUTCD compliant traffic cones, and five traffic flares if the cones are not equipped with flashers, and an automatic external defibrillator, AED. If a tanker is equipped with a fire transfer pump, the following minimum provisions also apply. And bear in mind, of course, we're still talking about mobile water supply apparatus. The pump should meet the requirements of either NFPA standard 1901, which is covered in chapter 16, fire pumps, and a minimum of 15 feet or 4.5 meters of supply hose or 20 feet 6 meters of hard intake hose with an intake strainer of the appropriate diameter for the pump, and it must be carried on the apparatus. It also should have at least 100 feet or 30 meters, one and a half inch, one and three quarter or two inch, which is 38, 45 or 52 millimeter fire hose, and one combination spray nozzle capable of flowing at least 95 gallons per minute or 360 liters per minute. And you might ask yourself, why do I need to know the metric measurements? The truth is that 90% of the world or better uses the metric system and we're still stuck in the imperial system. But beyond that, especially in wildland fires, we often draw on our neighbors from Canada and they are on the metric system. So you need to be as versatile in metric as you are in imperial, just as a footnote to that. The amount of water carried on a tanker depends on local preferences and a vehicle's chassis capability. One of the most common weight related design problems associated with tankers is trying to carry too much water on a specific chassis. Pumper tankers and square side tankers that are equipped with T-shaped water tanks on a single rear axle chassis should carry no more than 1,500 gallons of water, which is 6,000 liters. A single rear axle chassis equipped with elliptical water tanks should be limited to about 2,000 gallons or 8,000 liters of water. Tankers with a tandem rear axle generally are limited to about 4,000 gallons or 16 thousand liters of water. These figures do vary depending on gross vehicle rating of the chassis itself, the type of fire pump, if any, that's carried on the apparatus, the amount of hose and other equipment expected to be carried on the apparatus as well. Departments that desire to transport more than 4,000 gallons or 15,000 liters of water on a single vehicle will need to use tractor trailer arrangement that you see, for example, in this picture. Several factors must be considered when a fire department determines type and size of the tanker it wishes to operate. Terrain is a big consideration. Larger tankers do not perform well in jurisdictions where they will be required to climb steep hills or operate on winding roads. 
There's also a bridge weight limit. Fire departments also should determine load carrying capacity of bridges in their response district and identify alternative routes. Several factors must be considered when a fire department determines type and size of a tanker it wishes to operate. It needs to consider budgetary constraints and some fire departments that have response district that is suitable for operating large tanker may not have the financial resources to purchase one. So mutual aid becomes important. There must be compatibility with mutual aid tankers. Water shuttles flow more easily when they use tankers of similar size. Departments that operate together on a regular basis should coordinate size and design of their tankers. Then there are budgetary constraints. Some fire departments that have response districts suitable for operating a large tanker may not have the money to purchase one. So as we mentioned, you have to have compatibility with mutual aid tankers. And pumper tankers are available. And these are tankers equipped with large fire pumps as an attack apparatus. These are equipped like standard fire department pumpers in that they typically have fire pump capacity like a regular department pumper, but they must meet requirements for pumpers contained in NFPA standard 1901, chapter five. Their primary difference is the amount of water they carry overall. While standard pumpers typically carry a thousand gallons or 4,000 liter of water or less, Pumper tankers may carry as much as 3,000 gallons or 12,000 liters of water. This allows the apparatus to sustain a longer initial fire attack independent of external water supply. So if you've seen like a remote large fire and what looked like regular department engines there, what you're actually seeing are these pumper tankers that have really large water capacity. They look similar and they're built on a very similar chassis, if not the same chassis. But... Um, they are quite different in terms of the overall pumping capability. The disadvantage of pumper tankers, they're slower to respond. Well, they're huge and they're very heavy. And because of their size and weight, they may have difficulty accessing some fire scenes. Some review questions. Where might a mobile tank or water supply apparatus be required? Look on page 126 for the answer to that question. And what is one disadvantage of using a mobile water supply apparatus? That will be on page 131 of your text. Learning objective five. We will explain when and how aerial apparatus equipped with fire pumps are used. The primary function of a fire department aerial apparatus is to provide access for firefighters to upper levels of a structure and deploy an elevated master stream at a large fire. Quint is the common term for an aerial apparatus equipped with fire pumps. Any fire apparatus that is equipped with an aerial device, ground ladders, fire pump, water tank, and fire hose is considered a quint. And this is a picture of a quint. No doubt you're familiar with it. And now we'll discuss the aerial apparatus with fire pumps on board. Some common reasons for equipping aerial apparatus with pumps are that an apparatus can supply its own elevated master stream. This is important in jurisdiction with limited apparatus concept or the engine or ladder company functions can be performed based on needs. The apparatus may be used to initiate attack on a fire when an engine company is not pres present. The apparatus also can protect itself in high radiant heat situations. The aerial apparatus may be equipped with a variety of aerial devices. The capacity of pump on an aerial apparatus will vary depending on local jurisdiction's preference. To be considered a true quint according to NFPA standard 1901, an aerial apparatus must, must have at least a 1,000 gallon per minute or 4,000 liter per minute pump. Most departments that operate quints specify pumps considerably larger than the minimum. Pump capacities of 1,500 to 2,000 gallons per minute, which is 6,800 liters per minute, are more common. A quint equipped with a large pump can supply its own elevated master stream and portable master stream and hand lines, given sufficient water supply. NFPA standard 1901 also requires quints to have a water tank capacity of at least 300 gallons or 1,100 liters. 
Departments that do not choose to use apparatus as a full quint may specify a pump with capacity between 250 and 750 gallons per minute, which is 1,000 and to up to 3,000 liters per minute. NFPA requires these pumps to carry a supply volume of water at a pressure of 150 psi or 1050 kilopascals. That also will supply one or two small hand lines to handle small fires or allow firefighters to cool the apparatus when it's exposed to high level of radiant heat. The apparatus with smaller pumps may also be equipped with small water tanks ranging from 100 to 400 gallons, which is 400 to 1600 liters. NFPA 1901 contains an extensive list of fixed portable equipment that an aerial apparatus must carry. In general, standard requires, the standard requires quints to carry fewer ground ladders and less ladder company equipment and more hose and engine company equipment than a non-quint aerial apparatus. What is a quint? This will be on page 131 of your text. And the next review question, give two reasons why you might equip an aerial apparatus with a fire pump. That's on page 131 of your text. Learning objective six, we will explain when and how rescue vehicles equipped with fire pumps are used. The standard fire department pumpers are altered to carry additional rescue and extrication equipment. To provide rescue vehicle with limited firefighting capabilities, many fire departments equip dedicated rescue vehicles with smaller fire pumps, water tanks, and foam systems. Medium and heavy duty rescue vehicles often are equipped with small pumps and water tanks like those on non-quint aerial apparatus. Most departments that do this do so to allow rescue vehicles to make a limited fire attack when the pumper is not immediately on the scene. It also allows rescue personnel to provide protection lines or extinguish fires during automobile extrications when the pumper may not be on the scene as of yet. Having a fire extinguishing capability for a rescue vehicle means pump, pump panel, and water tank must be present, of course, and these consume valuable compartment space. So that may limit the weight of rescue equipment that may be carried The fire department must weigh the value of adding pump and water tank versus the loss of compartment space based on the amount of rescue equipment needed, number of personnel who typically will be riding the apparatus, and then it must evaluate its own experience with needing a fire attack capability when only a rescue vehicle was on scene of an emergency. A couple of review questions. Why might a department equip a rescue vehicle with a pumper? That will be on page 132 in your manual. And next question, what is one drawback to having a fire pump equipped on a rescue vehicle? That will be on page 133 of your text. Learning objective seven, we will explain when and how aircraft rescue and firefighting apparatus are used. These are also known as ARF or ARFF apparatus. These are specialized apparatus that can launch expedient attack on flammable liquid spill fires or flammable liquid spills fires using a foam water extinguishing agent independent of external water supply. These range from small rapid intervention vehicles to extremely large major firefighting vehicles that are the largest land-based fire apparatus. NFPA standard 414, which is the standard for aircraft rescue and firefighting vehicles, contains requirement for ARFF or ARF apparatus. The additional requirements for airports and ARF vehicles in the United States may be found in the FAA Federal Aviation Administration Regulations 14 CFR Part 139, which is the certification and operations land airports serving certain air carriers, and this dictates the requirements. The FAA AC 150-5200-10 is the guide for specifications for water foam type aircraft and rescue trucks. Then you have the FAA administration AC 150-5220-14A, which is the requirement for airport fire and rescue vehicle specification guide. Airports outside the United States followed the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO Annex 14, 
the international standards and recommended practices for aerodromes. In FPA 414 divides ARF apparatus into three general classifications, major firefighting vehicles, rapid intervention vehicles, and combined agent vehicles. ARF involves the largest land-based fire apparatus in existence. It is commonly carrying a pumping capacity of up to 2,000 gallons per minute or 6,000 liters per minute and can carry as much as 6,000 gallons or 24,000 liters of water and 600 or 2,400 liters of gallons of foam concentrate. Similar to major firefighting vehicles but smaller in size and capability are the rapid intervention vehicles. These typically have a pump capacity of 1,250 gallons per minute, which is 5,000 liters per minute or less, and carry no more than 1,500 gallons or 6,000 liters of water. Then you have combined agent vehicles. These are small initial attack vehicles intended to arrive on scene quickly and knock down and extinguish smaller fires. And part of that is for access uh, for the larger vehicles to get in and also um, to knock down a smaller fire that may be prohibiting uh, victims to exit the scene. These may or may not be equipped with a small fire pump, and we're talking about the, the small um, piece of equipment. They may or may not be equipped with a small fire pump, a foam system, and a water tank, but they will have a variety, variety of pressurized extinguishing agents, including dry chemical, halogenated agents, and premixed foam and water agent. So they may not have a pump, but they've got the premixed foam and water agent. It's under pressure and they can apply it quickly to small fires. Some review questions. Which firefighting extinguishing agents are used on ARF related fires? That will be on page 135 of your text. And which ARF apparatus are intended to arrive on scene quickly and knock down or extinguish smaller fires? That will be on page 134 of your text. Thank you for your time and attention class. If you have any additional, or if you need any additional explanation regarding anything in this chapter, please be sure to contact your instructor. Again, thank you for your time. We'll meet again for chapter eight.